Case flow testing has been the benchmark for testing the volumetric efficiency of external drain pumps and motors since their inception. The test is referred to by, the, by fluid power experts, pump and motor manufacturers, and machinery equipment manufacturers as the definitive test for determining the volumetric efficiency of pumps and motors that are externally drained. Students learn case flow testing at technical colleges and factory service schools. You'll also find case flow testing in most college textbooks. Regrettably, the most common technique most expo experts recommend is to discharge case drain flow into a bucket. Many reliability engineers and maintenance technicians that want to monitor their pump's volumetric efficiency on a routine schedule, non-invasively, go so far as to make flow meters per permanent fixtures in a pump's case drain line. For three decades, I have been teaching my students that while the experts might embrace pump and motor case flow testing, according to my research, case flow testing is unscientific. Let me explain what motivated me to explore the possibility that there might be a flaw in pump and motor case flow testing. My evidence in this video will be presented in two forms. First, I will use visual aids to show how contamination gradually rips a groove between the elongated ports in a pump and motor barrel and wear plate. The wear path links the ports and provides a pathway for the oil in a pump's pressure chamber to flow back to the pump's inlet chamber. Next, I will reenact the experiment I conducted over three decades ago in real time. In step one of the reenactment, I will run a new pump that is equipped with two flow meters, one in the pump's discharge port and the other in the pump's case drain port. I will also plot the parameters on a graph. Next, I will disassemble the pump and replace the new wear plate with a wear plate that has, been, that has wear between the ports, and I'll repeat the test. Now that I've presented the methodology I'm going to use, let me give you some background as to how I happened upon the problem. For a period of 10 years, I disassembled and inspected hundreds of hydraulic components to, to, to determine why they had failed. To no surprise, I found that contamination was the root cause of over 95% of hydraulic component failures. When I studied wear in external drain pumps and motors, I found that wear paths that contamination created did not lead the oil to the case, but rather led the oil to flow from the pump's discharge chamber back to the pump's inlet chamber. This is a, an animation of, or at least an exploded view of an axial piston pump. The green is the intake, the red is the discharge, and what I'd like to show you is that as the barrel is rotating, you're going to see in real time where this pump is leaking internally. You'll see leakage between the barrel and a wear plate here, leakage between the piston and the bore, and then, of course, there's a hole through the center of the piston, so it'll be leaking between the piston slipper and its wear plate. All right, so again, here's leakage between the barrel and the back plate occurring here, back, back, between the barrel and the back plate, leakage between the piston and its bore, and that leakage goes into the case and finds its way back to the hydraulic reservoir through the case drain line. And let me just uh, 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 say that again. This is typically where the industry uh, 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 encourages us to do the volumetric efficiency test on this type of pump in the case drain line. Now let's focus on the area that gets hardest, hardest hit by the contaminants. As you can see, and I'm, I'm going to just explain it before I play the video. As you can see, there's an elongated port on this side of the pump, that is the intake chamber, and that's the passage that allows the oil to go in behind the pistons. So from 6 o'clock till 12 o'clock, that's intake. Now, 
When we get to 12 o'clock, the piston starts to reverse, and the oil comes out the other side, and that's, of course, the pressure chamber. Now, let me show you the progression of wear, the natural progression of wear here. As the barrel is spinning, the oil contamination, if the oil is contaminated, it's going to start to rip a groove around between this channel to that channel, and progressively around until all of these uh, elongated ports are connected. And that now what's going to happen is, as soon as you connect the intake to the pressure, now we have a, a, a situation where the oil under pressure is going to be driven back through this passage to the intake of the pump. Contrary to popular belief, that oil cannot get into the housing. The only oil that's going to get into the housing is the oil that's going to leak either this way across the plate or into the center of the plate. But any oil that is leaking from the high pressure side of the pump to the intake is not going to find its way into the case. During my research, I found that unless the pump had suffered a catastrophic failure, in very few instances did the contamination breach the space between the elongated ports and the case. Since my discovery would scientifically invalidate case flow testing, I decided to conduct a test to prove my findings were scientific. Now that I've explained the problem theoretically, I'm going to perform the reenactment. I'm going to use this power unit for the, the reenactment. The pump on the power unit is a four gallon per minute Parker axial piston pump. As you can see, there is an analog flow meter in the pump's discharge port and a second analog flow meter in the pump's case drain port. There's also a load cell and pressure gauge in the pump's discharge port. I have installed the, uh, the good plate and barrel in the pump, and I'm going to plot the parameters on a graph. Let me introduce you to the graph I'm going to use for this purpose. This is a typical pressure flow graph anybody would use to test a pump. However, what I've added to it is, if you look at the, the, the left axis, vertical axis, that is the pump flow. That's the flow on the discharge side of the pump. The horizontal axis is always going to be my pressure, and the vertical axis on the right-hand side of the graph, I'm going to plot the case drain flow. So I'm going to simultaneously plot uh, the flow coming out of the pump on the pressure line and the flow that is discharging from the case drain line. The temperature is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The pressure at the pump's discharge port is 300 psi. The flow is four gallons per minute, and there's negligible flow in the case drain line. Let me show you that uh, on the graph. As we can see here, I'm at about 300 psi, and I have four gallons per minute. This is my no load flow outcome. The flow in my case drain line is negligible. I can't even read it on the flow meter. Now I'm going to load the pump. I'm going to slowly close the load cell. I'm increasing the pressure. I'm now at 1200 PSI. There is a marginal decrease uh, of the flow coming out of the pump on the discharge side of the pump. And I have a flow of two tenths of a gallon per minute into the, through the case drain line. So once again, let's go to the full load test. I'm at 1200 PSI. The flow has dropped marginally on the discharge side of the pump, and I've gained marginally to the case. So this is the kind of result we'd expect from a pump that is in good working condition. Now I'm going to lock out the power unit, disassemble the pump, and replace the good wear plate with a worn wear plate.
Earlier on, I showed you how the contamination rips a groove between the intake port through to the pressure port and progressively wears the groove all the way around the plate. Now here's an actual plate. This is the plate that I'm going to put back into this pump and I'm going to repeat the test. Once again you can see that I've got wear between the elongated ports identical to what you see here. So let's put this plate back in the pump and repeat the test. I disassembled the pump and removed the plate, plate that is in good condition. I'm going to replace it with the worn plate, the one that has the wear between the elongated ports, and then I'm going to repeat the test. The pressure in the pump discharge is just below 300 psi. The flow is 4 gallons per minute, or just below 4 gallons a minute. Once again, there is, I, I, there's not enough flow through the case drain line to read on this particular flow meter. It starts reading at 2 tenths of a gallon per minute. Now let me go back to the graph. We know for a fact that the pump has a bad wear plate. We know that. But notice on my no load test that my flow remains almost the same and there's a negligible amount of flow into the case drain line. Now I'm going to load the pump and see what happens. I'm increasing the pressure once again back to 1200 psi. I'm starting to see a decrease in flow on the discharge side of the pump as I increase the pressure drop across the pump's clearances. I'm going to stop at 1200 psi. And here's what's interesting. My flow has dropped to just below 3 gallons per minute on the pressure line, but I'm not even showing 2 tenths of a gallon per minute on the case drain line. According to the experts, Pump flow and case flow are directly proportional. Accordingly, if the pump flow decreased by one gallon per minute, the case flow will have to have increased by the same proportion, that is one gallon per minute. Now let's go back to the graph. As you can see, that's not what happened. My flow dropped from four gallons per minute down to three gallons per minute. According to the industry, I should have gained that one gallon per minute that I lost in the pressure line to the case. This would have been the anticipated result in a pump flow test. However, that's not what I got. This is what I got. I decreased my pump flow by one GPM, or if you will, 25%. And the actual result was no more than two tenths of a gallon per minute to the case. So here is now a comparative result. Once again, at 1200 PSI, my flow dropped from 4 GPM no load to 3 GPM full load. My case flow didn't increased to one GPM, it increased to two tenths of a gallon per minute. So the question is, where is the oil between these two data points on my, or at least these two lines on my graph? That oil is the oil that went back from the pressure side of the pump to the intake. What you have just witnessed is that a pressure line test and not a case flow test is without a doubt the definitive test for all hydraulic pumps, not only internal drain. Finally, there are additional factors that have steered me away from case flow testing for my entire career, or at least almost my entire career. In my basic hydraulics training, I learned that a hydraulic pump is the only component in a hydraulic system that does not stand alone for its performance. 
Two factors outside of the pump itself can affect flow. Those are pump speed and inlet restriction. Accordingly, it's imperative to test both RPM and inlet restriction when testing hydraulic pumps. This simply means that if the aim is to test the volumetric efficiency of a hydraulic pump, the test is invalid if pump inlet restriction and pump speed are not monitored in concert with pump flow. Of course, the symptom always dictates the suspects. Even if a pump case flow test was scientific, I would opt for a pressure line test over a case flow test and let me explain why. With a slide that shows the advantages and disadvantages of both pressure line and case flow testing. First and foremost, this is my pressure line test, this is my case flow test. Advantage, pressure line test. I do not need to know the pump flow when I do a pressure line test. In other words, if I have a 10 gallon per minute pump and I lose two gallons a minute, I know that's 20% at load. However, on a case flow test, if I have two gallons a minute coming out of the case drain line, was it two gallons a minute of? Is it two gallons a minute of 10? That number is unknown unless I know the flow. Second, a pressure line test will identify any problems with RPM. In other words, if I lose 10% of my speed, I automatically lose 10% of my flow. Since there is no relationship between case flow and RPM, a case flow test will not indicate that there's a problem with speed, which is something that I need to know. Next, a pressure line test will identify problems associated with cavitation or pseudocavitation. There's a direct relationship between a pressure a flow and what occurs on the inlet side of the pump. Since there is no relationship between the intake side of a hydraulic pump and the case drain line, a case flow test will not identify problems at the intake side of the pump. And finally, a pressure line test is 100% reliable, 100%. As you have just witnessed, a case flow test, the reliability is questionable. In other words, if you do a case flow test, did you actually see the condition of the pump or was the oil you looking for going back to the intake of the pump? Giving you, of course, a false positive on the condition of your pump. In my next video, I will demonstrate why the industry's definitive test for pressure control valves is just as flawed as the industry's definitive test for pump flow. If you want to learn safe and scientific techniques for testing hydraulic components, I encourage you to attend one of my upcoming hands-on workshops. You can review my 2020 schedule at our website, www.fpti.org. If you have any questions or comments about the subject video, please contact me at my, my email address forori at fpti.org. In the meantime, never attempt to test hydraulic components by removing oil transmission lines and discharging hydraulic oil to the atmosphere. It's one of the most dangerous things you can do because you can never anticipate the outcome. Yes, it can lead to an incident that can severely injure or kill you and or cause severe property damage. Until next time, be safe.